I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Hey, podcast listeners, Jim Sigley here for Brainwaves, a podcast about neurology and medicine and all the fascinating science and history that come with it. In a previous episode, episode 101 featuring Dr. Kathleen Murphy, we discussed a case of infectious encephalitis, a patient who had presented with fever and seizures. And we've also covered the basics of CSF analysis with Dr. Michael Rubenstein, episode 49. This week on the program, we're building on some of these prior concepts, and we will be reviewing the case of a patient that's more than just your run-of-the-mill encephalitis. Don't go anywhere. Like the other episodes of our Teaching Through Clinical Cases series, I got to speak with an expert in the field, Dr. Mike Bradshaw. I'm an assistant professor at the Chicago Medical School and uh, work at Billings Clinic in Billings, Montana. And this week's interview was kind of a two-for-one deal for me, because not only did I get to pick Dr. Bradshaw's brain as an expert in neuroinfectious disease, but seeing as he is a father of two, and I've just recently become a father myself, I thought I'd pick his brain on that as well. Before we get started, uh, any tips about how to raise children? What have you learned? (laughs) I think, I'm not sure that anything that you do actually makes any difference. (laughs) I think that's therapeutic nihilism. Lucky for me, there are only about three things that I can do with our 10-day-old baby Sophia. Nurse her, burp her, and change her diapers. No, uh, it's been a lot of fun with our, our, our two kids. It is really hard, especially in the beginning when your sleep is all disrupted and you're trying to work and everything. And so that's a hard period, but it, you know, it, it really does go by very quickly. And even now we just try and remember how brief our time is together and, and appreciate that for what it is, you know. But in between diaper changes and all the cute stuff, which is all you really remember anyway, my wife Erica let me get back into the studio changes we just had a blowout right before this phone call i thought i was gonna make it for a second but <laughs> yeah we call it the big summer blowout yep but in all seriousness dr bradshaw is an expert in encephalitis and that's what he really came onto the show to talk about encephalitis is interesting to me because it's um uh, it's at the confluence of several different subspecialties including infectious disease and critical care and neurology and and i like the diagnostic challenge that it presents I think it's the the workup is very interesting, and it often leads you to an unexpected diagnosis that I think is 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 exciting to work through. And that's exactly what we'll be doing today's program, working through a case of encephalitis. So, without further ado, let's get right to the case. Here we go, or here I go. A previously healthy 26-year-old woman presented to the ED with two weeks of upper respiratory tract symptoms. She had headaches, followed by confusion, fever, and then on the morning that she met you, she developed a new generalized seizure. It's kind of a little early on, but at this point, what is your differential diagnosis? What would you consider for an initial diagnostic workup for such a patient? Yeah, so um, obviously a detailed history and neurology examination are the most important elements of any um, presentation. So we have a very limited stem here, but sometimes that's what we're faced with when someone is is found unconscious and we just have some limited details. And so this is a realistic scenario. Um, I think before we even get into the differential considerations in, in this setting, which is concerning for encephalitis, um, the first priority is to assess the patient's ability to maintain her airway, her cardiopulmonary status, Your ABCs, treating for a seizure if she's still seizing, monitoring with continuous EEG if you're not sure, checking basic labs, correcting electrolyte abnormalities, the usual. And that should really all be happening simultaneously with the diagnostic evaluation. So given the course that we have here uh, with the fevers, headaches, confusion, all in the setting of a recent respiratory illness, and then this new seizure, um, that's highly concerning for an encephalitis. And I think it would be appropriate initially just load her with an anti-epileptic medication while you get your diagnostic evaluation underway. And because encephalitis and meningitis often overlap, sometimes we call it meningoencephalitis, and because those carry a high risk of mortality and morbidity, broad spectrum antimicrobials, including acyclovir, are are important uh, as soon as you can get them in. And, And really your diagnostic evaluation should not delay that treatment. If you can get CSF testing, et cetera, done, quickly, then um, then you should, uh, but you should not withhold those treatments while you're trying to get the diagnostic studies underway. So if it's going to be a few hours, you probably want to go ahead and start treatment. And this is such an important point that one should not withhold antibiotic therapy in the case of an adult with a suspected encephalitis or meningitis, 
But this patient's condition is more consistent with an encephalitis. Encephalitis, which we define as uh, brain inflammation with evidence of neurologic dysfunction, and, and this is a life-threatening emergency. One of the initial branch points in, in the approach here is encephalitis versus encephalopathy. Encephalopathy would be you know, confusion, memory loss, depressed mental status, which could be from a number of causes, such as you know, metabolic disorders. Uremia, hyponatremia, thyrotoxicosis, sepsis, conditions we already said you'd be working up while you are empirically treating for encephalitis, as long as you have a reasonable suspicion for a parenchymal brain infection, which is the very definition of encephalitis. Something that demonstrates inflammation, whether it's autoimmune or infectious in nature. And so we, we sort of... And typically, the diagnosis of encephalitis is made using a combination of clinical, laboratory, and neuroimaging criteria. T2 hyperintensities, with or without gadolinium enhancement, CSF pleocytosis, and so on and so forth. The International Encephalitis Consortium published a consensus statement in 2013 about this, which you can find a reference to in the show notes of our program. In this statement, and in Dr. Bradshaw's review article from Seminars in Neurology this past spring, There are excellent summaries as to how one might work up a patient with a suspected CNS inflammatory disorder. But like Dr. Bradshaw said, it's just as important to differentiate encephalitis from encephalopathy, if only to reduce the risk of exposing a patient to unnecessary antimicrobial therapies or invasive CSF testing, and to facilitate early targeted treatment. And likewise, sometimes you will have a patient who has a fever from a urinary tract infection and they have a seizure because they've lowered their seizure threshold, and it may not be encephalitis, but, but we have to be careful in that setting because the two can kind of coexist, a systemic infection and a CNS infection. So um, This is often the case in immunocompromised patients with a disseminated viral infection or a patient with bacterial meningitis or meningoencephalitis, who's typically also bacteremic, which we see more than 50% of the time. And I like to break it down into um, localization. So considering meningoencephalitis versus sort of a temporal lobe, limbic encephalitis, thalamic and basal ganglia, cerebellum, brainstem, etc. Because some infections are more likely to target specific brain regions or have different tropisms. The thalamus and basal ganglia, for instance, are more often targeted by respiratory viral pathogens, tuberculosis, toxo, and cryptococcus. The brainstem, listeria rhomboencephalitis, TB, treponema pallidum, Whipple's disease, And the temporal lobe is often the target of HSV-1, HHV-6, and 7, and the autoimmune limbic encephalitides, which we'll get to in a minute. And the diagnosis is very difficult to establish in many cases. So so typically, you can expect about a 50% diagnosis rate, and with a really thorough um, history exam and, and diagnostic studies, we can usually get that up to maybe 60%. But that still leaves us with a lot of cases where we We really are not sure what the underlying cause was. So we'll start with CSF testing with opening pressure, cell counts, gram stain, and cultures, testing for specific infections. Viral infections tend to be the most common in the United States, so enteroviruses, uh, herpes simplex virus, uh, West Nile virus, depending on the time of the year. That means PCR testing for enterovirus, herpes, HSV-1 and 2 PCR, and VZV, particularly if someone's immunocompromised, serum HIV testing, RPR, the CBC, a complete metabolic panel, blood cultures. And everyone rolls through the door with a head CT. A CT scan of the head is is often obtained in the emergency department. Ideally, you'll want an MRI with and without gadolinium, but sometimes the head CT can be helpful. Um, You can get an early sense of what may be going on or an early sense of localization based on findings on CT, areas of edema or herniation that that you'd want to know about. You might also find cytotoxic edema or petechial hemorrhage into the temporal lobes early on with HSV-1 encephalitis. You might see multifocal regions of hypointensity in cerebral toxoplasmosis or calcified foci if the toxo had been treated. You might encounter ventricular megaly with or without layering of hyperdense material in the ventricular system if there's ventriculitis, which is usually bacterial and is post-surgical. As quick as you can, you really do want to try to get to the CSF analysis. Um, And uh, I always like to throw in, uh, in this setting, an IgG index. And if the ratio is elevated, it means that there's intrathecal synthesis of the immunoglobulins, and that would support intrathecal inflammation. Which is useful for confirming your suspicion that an infection may be present. But we also see elevated IgG indices in other inflammatory CNS diseases, including autoimmune encephalitis. And oligoclonal bands are also useful to find it. 
they are not just elevated in multiple sclerosis, but in fact, more often we see them elevated in infectious causes. And then experts will recommend more targeted testing based on the patient's location or travel history. One thing, for example, in Montana, uh, West Nile virus is very common in the summertime, and West Nile meningoencephalitis or acute flaccid myelitis from West Nile is something that we see with some frequency up here. Or with recent travel to Africa, experts might recommend the testing of peripheral blood for malaria and trypanosomiasis, dengue. For travel to Asia, testing for Japanese encephalitis, dengue, malaria, and Nipah virus PCR is recommended. But in general, um, the approach is really pretty similar for any geography across the United States. Then there are recommendations based on exposure. In the warm months, tick-borne illnesses become more common. And some of the viral infections, you know, enterovirus tends to peak in, in late summer and early fall, and so they're more common there. With cat or other animal exposures, consider Bartonella testing, especially if the cell counts in the CSF are minimal, or rabies testing, which you may come across. If liver function testing is abnormal, you could see this in rickettsial diseases and tick-borne illness. With basal ganglia abnormalities on MRI, consider arbovirus, tuberculosis, rabies, and West Nile testing. But early on in the clinical course, when imaging may not have fully developed, or you just don't have all that relevant clinical history, you don't know all the environmental exposures, keep an open mind, because you might be surprised. Occasionally you'll, you'll have someone who had a pile of wood and they were out digging through the wood in the middle of winter and there happened to be a tick that survived in there and they got a tick bite and then they got some tick-borne encephalitis or something from that. So but th that would be the exception to the rule. Let's shift gears a bit. Where once we thought that an infectious agent was the most common cause of encephalitis, we're finding more and more that that's not quite the case. It's changed a lot with increasing recognition of autoimmune encephalitis. A number of cases are being recognized now. So where um, you know, in one population-based study reported by the Mayo Clinic in 2018, Dubey and colleagues reported some of the earliest numbers comparing the incidence rate of autoimmune versus infectious encephalitis. After excluding patients with encephalitis of unknown causes, both autoimmune and infectious encephalitis had a nearly exactly the same estimated incidence rate, 1 in 100,000. Autoimmune encephalitis was comparable in that study to infectious encephalitis. Even more striking was a 2012 paper published by Gable and Dalmau that showed NMDA receptor antibody-mediated encephalitis was not just as common as something like HSV-1. It was four times more common. It's actually more common as a single cause of encephalitis in those under 30 and was the most common cause in those under 18. So, so it really probably is autoimmune is comparable. We digress. Before we get too deep into the autoimmune stuff, let's return to our original case the young woman who had a few weeks of URI symptoms, headaches, fever, and then developed a seizure. So she gets this brain MRI. Um, it shows temporal lobe T2 prolongation with some faint enhancement on the right side. She does get the CSF testing, which uh, there were 150 white blood cells, 90% lymphocytes, so lymphocytic predominance. Protein was elevated at 100. The glucose was normal. And like you asked for, she had an elevated IgG index and five oligoclonal bands. In addition, the HSV-1 PCR did come back positive. Uh, so for this, she was started on intravenous acyclovir, but while the HSV-1 PCR was pending, she was also started on ceftriaxone and vancomycin. For her seizure, she was given levetiracetam, and for the fever, acetaminophen. Yeah, so this patient, again, she, she, her clinical presentation was um, a relatively rapidly progressive, as far as we can tell. Again, the, the temporal profile is very useful for an initial broad sweeping differentiation between infectious and autoimmune, where whereas autoimmune tends to be more subacutely progressive over the course of weeks to um, you know a month or two, and infectious encephalitis tends to be more rapidly progressive, though that's not specific by any means. Um, but her findings of the asymmetric T2 hyperintensity in the mesial temporal lobe and the CSF analysis with a you know moderate CSF pleocytosis of lymphocytes. And, you know, some evidence of inflammation, again, the IgG index is high in oligoclonal bands. Um, that's pretty typical for what you would see from a HSV encephalitis. The range, is, the range of what findings is fairly broad, but that's a pretty typical story. But that's not the whole case. She gets her three weeks of IV acyclovir, remains stable on levetiracetam, and she improves at rehab. And then something else happens. But a few weeks later, she developed new headaches, she had some confusion, and new recurrent seizures despite levetiracetam. 
Maybe not all that unusual to have more seizures following a case of HSV-1 encephalitis. It's a severe neurologic disease. She may have been subtherapeutic on levetiracetam, she could have missed a dose, or the HSV-1 could have been incompletely treated with acyclovir. This patient could also, for whatever reason, be having more seizures now, whether that's structural changes related to the initial injury of the HSV encephalitis, which is very inflammatory and hemorrhagic, uh, or likewise, they could have had a focal hemorrhage somewhere that could be precipitating their recurrence of seizures, and CSF, again, is improved compared to previous. Or maybe she had some other infectious process from her hospitalization that's now lowering her seizure threshold. So you would still want to look for evidence of infection in there. Any number of things could have happened. And then she would have these episodes of bradycardia and kind of apneic events uh, while she was critically ill. Now that's a bit unusual, but maybe not all that surprising. Yeah, so now here we are a few weeks out from her initial presentation, and essentially she's representing with with findings that, again, could be consistent with encephalitis. I, I didn't hear a fever here, but the headaches, confusion, and new seizures, et cetera, and now these episodes of autonomic dysfunction. The approach, again, would be similar. There's a possibility that she could still have or have a reemergence of HSV encephalitis, and so so it's still appropriate to perform, again, that a similar approach as to her initial You get the same things all over again, repeating basic labs, getting another head CT, and most likely an MRI of the brain, with and without contrast. You know, the EEG monitoring, CSF analysis would all be important, and probably gets a And you'd be repeating that HSV-1 PCR to make sure she hasn't relapsed, and that she's responding to the acyclovir. Relapses with HSV-1 are not that uncommon. They occur maybe 5 to 25% of the time. But resistance to acyclovir is rare, maybe one out of every 300 cases of HSV, according to some population-based data in the U.S. But you would also look for other infectious etiologies, with gram stain and culture, and then non-infectious etiologies, including autoimmune causes of encephalitis, which is especially concerning given some of her newer symptoms. Here's Dr. Bradshaw again. She's having autonomic dysfunction as well, bradycardia and apneic events. And this presentation at this point would raise the specter of a possible post-HSV encephalitis. Like a non-infectious type of brain inflammation. An autoimmune encephalitis. Which is something that actually happens. That would be one of the concerns we'd have here. So a post-HSV encephalitis encephalitis. It sounds crazy, but this is something that you're going to see in the hospital. According to one prospective observational cohort based out of Spain involving 51 patients with HSV encephalitis, one in four patients returned for follow-up over the course of a year and developed an autoimmune encephalitis, 64% of whom had antibodies to the NMDA receptor. This has been happening for a long time. Uh, There are descriptions in the literature going back quite some time of patients who would have an HSV encephalitis, which would be confirmed based on the diagnostic gold standard at the time, who would then return within some weeks with what seemed to be uh, some sort of a relapse, but their HSV testing at that point would be negative. And these were sort of presumed to be an autoimmune encephalitis, but it wasn't really until recently, the last couple of years. And so we see that some 20 to 30% of patients develop what seems to be some sort of a relapse. And given the relatively quick time course, usually within a few weeks of HSV-1 encephalitis, these patients may just look like they're progressing with their HSV encephalitis. Or they may have a brief period of improvement only to experience a, quote, relapse of their HSV. And so in one study that Tysar Meng and Joseph Dalmau published in Lancet last year, the median was about 32 days and the range was 7 to 61 days. Um, and this can easily be... Which gives us all the more reason to repeat diagnostic testing and repeat the MRI like we did in this patient's case. She had a repeat MRI, which uh, showed bilateral, like subtle mesial temporal T2 changes, but nothing else really new. But hopefully, the clinical features may be suggestive of this alternative diagnosis. Um, But adults tend to be more often misdiagnosed. And and part of that is related to the clinical features. So in children um, less than four years of age or around four years old and under, they tend to have more choreathetosis, behavioral changes. Um, depressed level of consciousness or seizures, while teenagers and adults will typically present more predominantly with neuropsychiatric or behavioral changes. For those of you who've read Brain on Fire, my name is Susanna Kahalen. A lot like that. Regress. Manic behavior, paranoia. 
Each of them is giving us a different diagnosis. One is saying bipolar, next one is saying schizophrenic, then they're saying psychotic. Well, not exactly like that. There is some creative license in the film. Returning to our patient, though, she had an increase in seizure frequency and an alteration of consciousness with autonomic disturbances, but it was probably too soon to see any of the other neuropsychiatric manifestations. So we proceeded with confirmatory diagnostic testing. She had a repeat lumbar puncture, which showed a, a small lymphocytic pleocytosis, 20 white blood cells, and uh, the HSV1 PCR was negative. So she was continued on the acyclovir, and additional testing was performed, which included the broad-spectrum um, autoimmune and perineoplastic encephalitis profile, which did come back positive for an NMDA receptor antibodies in her CSF at a ratio of 1 to 640. So this is a typical sort of representation uh, or, or presentation of this syndrome, and she's got the NMDA receptor antibodies in her CSF. One thing that's an interesting thing to talk about is is how can we or can we predict patients who are likely to develop autoimmune encephalitis after HSV encephalitis? An interesting question, right? Seeing as it is so common to develop an autoimmune encephalitis after a primary HSV encephalitis, maybe 25% of the time, according to the Spanish data from the 2018 Lancet paper we keep referencing, then it begs the question, are there any risk factors that might identify these patients before they go on to develop an autoimmune encephalitis? The answer at this point is no. They don't really look that different for the patients who go on to develop autoimmune encephalitis compared to those who do not. There was not really an appreciable difference there. And in CSF testing, CSF was not significantly different between the two groups either. And in all cases that... Um, the investigators of that Spanish cohort... They looked at all kinds of clinical and radiographic and serologic factors. Age was no different. Sex, the same. Symptoms of fever, prevalence of seizures, behavior disturbance, aphasia, altered consciousness. All of these were similar between the groups with and without post-HSV autoimmune encephalitis. Other features like lesion volume on flare or DWI, presence of contrast enhancement, CSF white blood cell count or protein, these were similar between the groups as well. Then the investigators asked, did the treatment of the initial HSV encephalitis augment the risk of a post-infectious inflammatory response? Turns out, treatment had no impact either. The duration of acyclovir administration, which guidelines recommend to be 14 to 21 days, was no different between the groups. The delay to acyclovir initiation and whether or not steroids were used, all of it was the same. But maybe the study was underpowered to identify differences in who would go on to develop an autoimmune encephalitis. In their analyses, however, some comparisons made an impression on me. Looking at the proportion of very young children, children four years and younger, twice as many of these patients would go on to develop an autoimmune encephalitis than not, 43% versus 19%, with a P of 0.089. And almost all of these children who developed a post-infectious autoimmune encephalitis harbored antibodies to the NMDA receptor. 89% of children had the NMDA receptor antibodies whereas only 61% of older patients had NMDA receptor antibodies. Kind of curious. Why would younger children be more predisposed to having an autoimmune complication and specifically develop antibodies to the NMDA receptor? Next, consider the CSF profile that was checked three weeks after presentation. A quarter of patients had already begun to develop antibodies to the NMDA receptor or other neuronal cell surface antigens. For the patients who produced these antibodies, they'd be at a 12-fold greater odds of later developing symptomatic autoimmune encephalitis. Really, the only thing that they found that seems to predict an individual's risk of developing autoimmune encephalitis was the presence of neuronal autoantibodies at three weeks from the HSV encephalitis. And, so, uh, and lastly, as these patients were followed over time, patients who had necrosis and cystic brain lesions on four-month MRI, they were far more likely to develop an autoimmune encephalitis. 100% of patients with autoimmune encephalitis had these cystic necrotic lesions, whereas only 50% of patients without autoimmune encephalitis had those necrotic changes. A reasonable thing to do would be to have any patient with an HSV encephalitis be seen within a month or so of their discharge to have a neurologic examination and follow-up, just looking for any early signs of an autoimmune uh, encephalitis. And given this data... I don't think anybody would be faulted for repeating an MRI to look for cystic necrosis, 
or checking the CSF at follow-up for neuronal cell surface antibodies, like the NMDA receptor antibodies. Let's change the story up a bit. So say this person, this young woman, comes back to clinic a month later, as you recommended, and she's now had a few other small seizures uh, since then, but admits to not being fully compliant with her levetiracetam. You do recommend a lumbar puncture, and the lumbar puncture comes back, and, and you do find that she does have you know, an elevated NMDA receptor antibody titer in the CSF. What's to say that these are not pathogenic antibodies that you happen to come across? When are they pathogenic and when are they something that you want to aggressively follow? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. And I would say that just from that initial stem that you gave there, you know, she was non-adherent to her anti-epileptic medication. And so she had a few breakthrough seizures and she's not presenting with a clinical syndrome that would suggest an encephalitis. She doesn't have progressive altered mental status, et cetera, et cetera. And so in that person, I, I probably would not have done the CSF testing at that point because I would have said, you know, take your, your seizure medication. Let's see how things go. So the clinical context, whether someone has an antibody or not, the clinical context is always important. This is the classic teaching that you're treating a patient, not a lab value. Getting back to that Spanish cohort that Dr. Bradshaw and I keep referencing, having cell surface antibodies in the CSF will increase one's risk of developing the autoimmune encephalitis, but it is not a guarantee. Looking back at that data, 11 out of 30 patients in that cohort who never went on to develop a clinical encephalitis and had the IgG antibodies in their CSF, three of whom had NMDA receptor antibodies, they never went on to develop a clinical encephalitis. I would say that in general, for the NMDA receptor antibody, which, which again, this would be an IgG antibody, those antibodies are pathogenic in cultured neurons and in animal models. So I would tend to have a high index of suspicion of those antibodies being pathogenic. Again, that does require, you, know, you do need to know that the lab was sent to a reputable lab that's doing the testing correctly. Now, if that patient had come in and she was having a bunch of seizures, but she was adherent to her medication and say she started having more cognitive difficulty, Again, if you found antibodies in her CSF that are known neuronal antibodies, it would be very reasonable to empirically treat her with immunotherapy. While we've learned more and more about the mechanisms and the management of NMDA receptor encephalitis in the past 13 years that we've known about the condition, many questions remain. Historically thought of as more of a perineoplastic phenomenon related to ovarian teratomas, given the higher prevalence among women at a ratio of 4 to 1. We also recognize it as an autoimmune phenomenon, and one that's triggered by HSV. But we haven't figured it all out. How does HSV-mediated inflammation of the brain trigger the development of antibodies to the NR1 subunit of the NMDA receptor, and to other neuronal surface antigens? Some have hypothesized that molecular mimicry of the NR1 subunit or persistent CNS inflammation of the limbic structures may lead to autoantibody formation. And yet, we've seen from several cohorts that adjunctive steroid treatment neither benefits patients with HSV encephalitis, nor does it reduce the risk of post-infectious autoimmune encephalitis. More research into the field is certainly needed. So, So we do need further studies to sort of evaluate that. Um, and I would say that in general, and like Dr. Bradshaw mentioned at the conclusion of our discussion, the neurologist is uniquely poised to assist with the clinical management of these patients and swiftly identify this common complication of HSV encephalitis, hopefully with the goal of expediting the appropriate treatment. I think one thing that hopefully we'll see more of is, is increasing levels of collaboration between infectious disease and primary care and neurology. And, and I do think that there's a good role for the neurologists especially, for example, like we say in the post-HSV encephalitis, because we really are uniquely positioned to do a a thorough and sensitive cognitive evaluation of that patient. And ideally, you know, the same neurologist would see them in-house and uh, discharge, so that doesn't always happen. But even even still, uh, a good neurologic cognitive examination at the time of discharge from the hospital or from rehab is really a nice, valuable thing that's, that's often not done. But even something as, as straightforward as a, a MOCA exam or something that's objective and relatively easy to reproduce can add a lot of value. So, so I think the neurologist's role in, in encephalitis is, is valuable, as are the roles of the other clinicians. And I think we probably are in the best position to look for subtle signs of an early 
representation with a post-infectious autoimmune syndrome. Thank you so much, Dr. Bradshaw. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a, it was a pleasant conversation. Mike Bradshaw. He's an assistant professor of neurology at the Chicago Medical School and the site director of the Billings Clinic in Billings, Montana. Huge thanks to Dr. Bradshaw for coming on and sharing his experience and his research with us on today's program. And a big personal thank you to Mike because it's really just nice to have a little bit of reassurance that raising kids gets better, possibly easier, and you eventually find your own rhythm. So yeah, no, it's pretty fun, but it is it is once you get your rhythm that helps a lot and then and then your child is like, "Oh, you have a rhythm, I'll change." <laughs> well, maybe you find that rhythm. But it's all about the journey, right? The problem solving, the troubleshooting, the gratification of getting something right, and that incredible feeling of reward and responsibility for caring for another person. A lot like treating a patient with encephalitis. So, you see, it all comes full circle. This episode of the Brainwaves Podcast was produced by myself and Michael Bradshaw. The music for the program was courtesy of Jan Terrian, Unheard Music Concepts, Steve Coombs, and Mont Plaisir under a Creative Commons license. Sound effects by Mike Kunig and Daniel Simeon. For more information about what was discussed, take a look at each week's show notes for the references used to put together the program. If you haven't rated the show on iTunes, please take a minute to do this. We'd love to know how we're doing. And if you haven't started to follow us on Twitter or Facebook, you can check us out at Brainwaves Audio. Coming up, we'll be talking about black box warnings and risk mitigation, which is a lot more interesting than you might think, as well as personal encounters with Tourette syndrome and Pompe disease. Stay tuned for that. I'm Jim Siegler. Talk to you soon.